Thank you so much for joining us for today's program on the new generation of post-pandemic HVAC systems. We'll get started with the presentation after I cover a couple of quick housekeeping items. First, by participating in this webinar, you are granting your permission to be recorded and for the recording to be distributed as AIADC and the Washington Architectural Foundation may choose. Second, we'll have time for Q&A after the lecture, so please type any questions you have into the Q&A box and we'll relay those to our presenter after his presentation concludes. So now I'm pleased to turn it over to Shu Bei Yong from our Asian American Designers Union. Hello everyone, welcome. We're AEDU, Asian American Design Union. We're a platform for empowering Asian American professional working in the built environment discipline to grow personally and collectively. Our goal is to motivate professional development, foster leadership skills, and promote collaboration within and beyond the Washington DC area. Today, we have Chuck, who's a 25-year uh, experience in HVAC industry. Uh, welcome, Chuck. Good morning or good afternoon. All right, so if we're ready to go, um, you know, as you can see, I've been involved in the heating and air conditioning industry my entire life. I'm a third generation. Um, when it comes to, again, as we call it the newer technology, you know, we're talking about mini splits, we're talking about VRF, we're moving away from the unitary, which has been the steadfast way for probably over a century um, in reference to heating and air conditioning. So with that, let's move to our next slide, please. Um, it's becoming very, very important because of the um, world that we live in today um, and the pandemic that we're dealing with that we learn how to control um, our quality of air in our living space. Um, next. Um, so indoor air quality is becoming the, the forefront of what we're doing. And with that, um, the average human body takes in 1,770 gallons of air on an average day. With that being said, 1,320 gallons of that air is indoor air. So with this, it makes it very, very important that we learn how to control what is in that air. Next. You know, I mean, again, we've got, to, we've got to take care of our health. We've got to find ways to do that. And in doing that, um, we need, you know, we need to remove the dust, the dandruff, the pollen, the smoke, the odors, um, the pathogens, mold, viruses, and bacteria. And th there's a group of different ways to do that. And this is what we are looking to achieve in moving on to newer technology. Next. Okay, so improving our air quality, which has become our priority. And we're doing this through different types of ventilation and filtration systems um, by utilizing ultraviolet, um, you know, germicidal um, systems. So it's a combination of many different items um, that, you know, we use today to, to build what we're doing. Next. Okay, so with a ventilation system, um, the common way of using um, our unitary product is through um, either a furnace or an air handler unit. Um, and with that, we're just basically um, supplying and returning indoor air. So we're, we're recirculating through, um, through a building. And the only way that we're trying to reduce 
any of the air quality problems is through the filtration system. But now we have ERVs, which are um, energy recovery systems. And with that, that allows us to um, add outside air into the ventilation system, which will help clean up um, and remove most of the items that we're talking about. The average ERV system comes standard with about a MERV-6 or a MERV-8 filter, um, but most of them have the availability to add a HEPA filter with, with that. And in doing so, we're able to clean up the air in, in an indoor space up to 99%. Next. Um, you know, as, as we see here and, and more and more equipment nowadays is, is not coming through with just a simple filter um, rack. Um, we're, we're adding additional filter racks so that we're, we're able to control the amount of viruses or bacterias that um, we have. So we have a, a pre-filter, which is normally, you know, like a MERV A6 or 8, which will remove about 50%. Um, and then with that, we can, you know, take and add um, a MERV like 13 to 16, which will reduce um, anywhere from 85 to 95 percent, and then we can finally finish this off with a HEPA filter, um, which will remove about 99 percent of any of the particles or contaminants that we have in the air. As you can see here, um, you know, MERV has become a um, a terminology, um, you know, minimum efficiency reporting values. Um, and with that, a lot of companies are building their filters based upon the different specifications that this has brought to light. And, you know, as you can see here, you know, a MERV one to four, maybe about 20%, um, five to eight, we, we can go up to 60% um, and all the way up to 16, which is about 98%. Um, and with that, you know, like you said, you know, you final that off with a HEPA filter and, you know, we can control up to 99% of the particles um, or contaminants that are in the air. Next. As you can see here, we're just, you know, elaborating a little bit further on, on how um, these different types of filters and, you know, what they do and, and their, um, how they capture different types of microns of, of contaminants. Next. All right, with UV, and that adds a whole nother dimension um to what we're doing and normally you can add a, a uv light um in off the coil and with that it's another way to approach the the removal of again um odors or allergies or you know um bacteria, uh, you know, different spores, things that, again, the viruses that are out there today that we're trying to control, um, we're looking for the most effective way of, of controlling it. So with a combination of filter systems and uh, UV protection, um, we're hopefully able to accommodate that. Next. Yeah, and as you can see here, you know, with, with the UV, um, many of the equipment today has space 
um, designed so that you're able to um, place a UV light and, and you usually do this um, again, right off the coil because all the airflow travels through the coil before it enters um, into the home or, or building. Next. With that being said, um, Gree to Sot, uh, which is one of the largest manufacturers in the world of heating and air conditioning equipment, has come out with a product that is called the T Unix. And with that, um, it's a inverter driven system, um, which saves, saves energy. So besides talking about finding ways to um, clean up the air, uh, we're looking at ways to heat and cool and be most efficient in doing that. So with the T-Unix system, um, they are designed in two and three ton inverter outdoor units um, with direct drive um, it, air handler units for the inside. Um, so we have a two and three ton, we have a four and five ton. And this goes up to 20 SEER. And with it, we are 24 volt interfaced. So you're able to use anybody's thermostat um, or smart technology. And the ODU or outdoor unit for these systems are designed with the ultra heat capacity. And with having ultra heat capacity in the Northeast, um, we're able to obtain minus 22 at about 80%. We're at about minus four degrees at 100%. So with that, you don't need to use backup heat, um, which, be, which becomes very cost prohibitive. Um, so with this now, um, it's adding a, a whole nother dimension in um, the inverter technology world. Next. Zoning. Okay, so with unitary product, um, which again, it's been around for probably almost a hundred years. And, and with that, you know, you've got a furnace or an air handler that has a, a fan and a coil in it and it's blowing air. Um, and it's usually controlled by one thermostat. So with that, if you have a multi-level facility, um, what happens is, is that parts of it are going to be warm and parts of it are going to be hot or cold. So they created what they call zoning. And with zoning, what you're doing is you're putting dampers in your ductwork. And then each damper is controlled by a stat in each one of the rooms. Now, this isn't a perfect world because it really doesn't allow you to control the temperatures the way you, you want them today. Um, people get to the point that if it's more than, you know, two or three degrees difference, then, you know, they've got a problem with it. So with zoning, all you're doing is you're restricting the flow and in restricting the flow, you're kind of adjusting the temperatures. But moving into the mini split world, we are literally able to control the temperature in certain different spaces. Next. Okay, so as we, as I mentioned before, with the inverter technology, um, we're looking to find ways to also save energy. And 
as you know, a standard heat pump system, the outdoor unit is 100% on or 100% off. But with an inverter technology, you are, the easiest way to, to put that is with, um, is with modulation. So the inverter outdoor unit is actually modulating and it's modulating actually down to as much as a quarter of a degree. And by doing that, you know, you're able to save anywhere from 30 to 40% of your energy cost. And besides that, you're allowed to create personal comfort. So for each room that you have either a cassette unit or a floor ceiling unit or a wall hung unit, each one of them is independent of each other and they are temperature sensitive. So you're able to set the temperatures that you want in that space. Next. With that also, we're able to, you know, again, uh, with this technology nowadays, we also have filtration systems built into these pieces of equipment. Um, we're also able to control the humidity in the air. So we're able to dehumidify, um, you know, where necessary. And, you know, by being able to control your temperature, um, you know, you're, you're able to, you know, keep, you know, fresher air longer. Next. So here is just the basic idea about you know, what can be offered um, with a multi-system. So instead of just using a standard furnace or vertical air handler, um, you're able, we're able to put together um, We're able to put together multi-head systems and with this you're able to put these into spaces where you're looking to absolutely control temperature so if you've got a family room you have a kitchen you have a dining room and you want to keep them at different temperatures um, in reference to heating or cooling you're able to do so by putting independent heads in those areas. Um, another nice thing about the mini split technology is that 15 years ago, most people thought of a mini split as strictly a cooling item. Um, with that, you know, over the last five or six years, most manufacturers of this type product have focused on heating. So depending upon what part of the country you live in, you are focusing either on heating or cooling. So up in the Northeast, you know, from say, say Virginia, North, we would be more focused on designing a system based on heating. Um, down in the Southeast, if we're getting down into Georgia and Florida, Alabama, Mississippi, um, we may want to design a system based on cooling. But with that, you know, we're able to cool, but we're able to control cooling and heating much more efficient. And in doing that, we're saving energy. Next. Smart. Okay, smart technology is where everything's going. We've got smartphones, we have smart computers, we have 
tablets. We have everything that today's world brings us, and it, it leads all back into the idea of smart technology. How can we control and save energy and and do things simply? And we're able to do it from our iPhone, our, our you know iPhone or um, smartphone, um, whether it be Android or or Apple technology. Next. So with that. All the major thermostat companies have created um, thermostats that are now Wi-Fi compatible. That allows you to control um, your space either through the Wi-Fi or through um, through the cell phone. Um, and you know, normally, um, I was always taught that. You know, if you're programming a system, you normally don't want to change more than three to five degrees. And in doing so, um, it, it, it is more cost effective um, in reference to saving energy. And when you look at, you know, changing space, um you're here you're home in the morning and you're here for an hour or two hours and then you're off and you're you know in an office or you're out running around and you know i mean i know more and more people today are working from home but still um you may want the space to be cooler even than when your family is there so you may want to reduce the temperature a couple degrees well, with programmable thermostats, again, you're able to set them. Um, or if you've got them set up on smart technology through your cell phone or your iPad or tablet, um, you're able to control it um, by simply taking a look at, at what's going on. I mean, a real simple um, you know, comment that, that, you know, I look at is that I have an 89 year old um, mother in law that loves to keep her um, apartment at like 85 degrees. And, you know, all we're doing is throwing money out the window. So with that, I have a, um, a smart thermostat in there and I'm able to watch and control. Um, her thermostat, um, and you know, and you know, we if I let it go too much, I mean, you know, her energy bill is sky high. But you know, you know, through the day, you know, we keep it at a, a relatively, you know, easy, you know, seventy three, seventy four, and it helps save energy. So the smart technology um, is something that. You know, we're all taking advantage of to find ways to save energy. Next. All right. Something that um, has really, really moved the mini split world into a whole nother area is they've created what's known as heat recovery. Heat recovery, though, is only offered um, in larger um, outdoor equipment. So heat recovery starts at about six ton and can go up to, um, I mean, whatever number you want to put together. But what happens with heat recovery is we're able to heat and cool at the same time. So how that's achieved is now we're not doing a two pipe system, which is a standard mini split world, um, where you have liquid line and you have refrigerant. Well, now what you're doing is you're taking, um, 
a three pipe system running it through a mod exchanger, which allows you to either take um, some of the hot gases or cool gases and recirculating them through space before you return them to the outdoor unit and then reinsert them back into the indoor units. So in doing this, we're able to utilize um, some of these temperatures at a much better um, rate, but also offer people both cooling and heating at the same time. Next. With that technology also comes solar. And, you know, the solar technology has been here in the United States for, oh, oh my God, at least 40 years. Um, back in the 80s, um, I was involved with a group that, you know, we were, we were, we were doing solar panels on homes and, you know, we were strictly at the very beginning um, utilizing it actually to um, do hot water. Um, so we were, we were doing hot water heaters at the very beginning with this. And that was, like I said, it was, it was 20 years, 40 years ago. Um, but by, but by doing, by using solar technology, one thing that, that Greed did that nobody else did was, is we literally got our ODUs, which is an outdoor unit, certified with solar technology. So what we're able to do is we're able to go directly from solar panels right to our ODUs. And with that, we transfer that technology into the power source to operate our, our outdoor units. And um, Gree was the first to do that. Next. All right, as we, I mean, we discussed this a few minutes ago, you know, we're, we're, we're talking about being able to do heat recovery. And, you know, again, we do the heat, you know, we're able to control whether we're doing cooling or heating, but with a head in each space, we're able to control that space to the comfort level of the people in that space. And we're able to reduce energy costs um, by 30 or 40 percent. Next. Gree, Gree, again, with our solar units, we actually go down to three ton. So um, with an ODU, or which is an outdoor unit, um, we can do three ton, four ton, six ton, and eight ton. Um, and you can do as many as you need. So you're not limited to one of those sizes. You're basically only limited by how many solar panels you're able to utilize. Um, and we are able through our controllers program temperature. Um, and you know, as we said before, you know, you create a comfort level for what you have. Um, but then when you're not in a space, you don't want to burn up energy. So, excuse me, you set up a, a, um, a program to reduce temperature or raise temperature based upon occupancy. Next. All right, um, what we're showing you here um, is that this is a project that is here in Philadelphia. Um, 
called, it was called Charter Court at the time. Uh, it's two apartment buildings. They are 250 units per building. And with this, um, what was happening is there was an organization that wanted to purchase this building. Um, and the old system in here was steam heat. And it was, was not cost effective at all. Um, and they were looking at what they needed to do to upgrade. Um, and with that, it made it more cost prohibitive for them to buy this building. So they reached out to, you know, um, us and we worked along with a general contractor and a, a mechanical contractor and we designed a system for them to change over from steam heat to um, VRF. And in doing so now, not only offered them the heat for this project, now the, the tenants all had cooling because what was happening is, is that the, the tenants were actually just putting window units in which as we know, window units are not cost effective at all. And when your electric bill is all being generated back to the owners, that was not cost prohibitive at all. So, so they looked at, as they were putting together their due diligence to buy this property, it's, you know, what kind of heating and air conditioning system can we do that um, will allow them to buy this building and make a profit at it. Um, one other thing that we created with this is that um, it's able to be controlled from afar um, and we have billing technology with it. So um, let's go to the next. So these are the buildings. Again, we got two buildings. They look like um, a T. So with that, it also made it um, an opportunity for us to even control it even better um, and help keep the cost of running the systems down. Next. Here's some of the, um, the spaces and in, in, in the indoor units. What, what we have in these two buildings, we have a total of 750 tons of outdoor units. The indoor units are approximately almost 1,200 of them. So that's telling you that each and every space that has a wall hung unit, we are controlling the temperature at that spot. So um, each apartment had a minimum of two indoor units, one in the living area and then one in the bedroom. Um, there is two bedroom and three bedroom apartments. So some of the apartments had up to five. Um, indoor units in them. Then what we did is so that we can condition the, the hallways and that's something that they never had before. Um, so what we did is at the end of each corridor, we installed a, um, an IDU and that kept the temperature um, in that space at a comfortable level. With that, it allowed us um, to also help save energy. Next. 
what we also did is what we also did is we offered centralized controlling so each tower um, became its own centralized system so we were able to um, review and set point you know te uh, temperature points on each tower through a centralized controller um, which help us again control the energy cost um, another thing that through green we were able to offer is we're offered a centralized billing system and with the billing system we, we take the refrigerant flow to each and every indoor unit um, and that converts the refrigerant flow to a kilowatt hour and they're able to log each and every indoor unit and charge the customer back for the electric that they use. This became, this became um, a revenue source for them. And with that revenue source, their ROI for this multi-million dollar project was less than five years. Next. As you can see, um, the ODU units, what we did is we set up different stacks. So um, we're an 11 story, we're two 11 story buildings. So we're able to control a group of floors um, through different through different stacks. And this this these two buildings have a total of 92 um, outdoor units. Next. Here again, it just shows you some of the piping and, and how the layout work works and um, how all of the equipment is mounted about 18 inches um, off the roof level. That, that allows um, for the fact that if we have snow, um, we're not gonna have an issue in that um, interfering with the operation um, of the um, roof units. Next. This here, this is another project that, that has been done up in Northeast Pennsylvania. And as I mentioned earlier, um, GRE offers ultra heat technology. So with ultra heat technology, we're able to maintain 100% capacity below zero degrees. Um, so a project came to us and it's about a 60 or 70 year old building um, that is a school. And with that, they had a bunch of old P-tacks and um, antiquated ways of giving, doing the heat. But what they weren't able to offer is cooling. So, you know, as we know, with a bunch of these old schools come, you know, late spring or early fall, it's still 70, 80 degrees out and it becomes very uncomfortable. Um, so with it, learning capacities are, are, are minimal. So what we did is because the way this building was laid out, we have 21 four ton ultra heat outdoor units. Um, and with that, um, we have a multiple different lineup of IDUs that we used. Um, in some spaces, we used wall homes. In other spaces, we use four cassette, four, four way cassettes. Um, in other areas, we use two way cassettes. You know, we we had the versatility to accommodate the different spaces. And with that now, 
um, we're able to save them 30 to 40% of their energy cost and also not only heat the space, but cool the space, um, which worked out quite well. Next. As you can see here, um, we're looking now at a group of projects that are all over the world. Um, you know, as, as we all know, when, when it comes to the United States and energy, we, we've been the most wasteful country um, in the world. And, you know, with that, you know, we, we were always good for, you know, I've seen some ads for where they, um, where they literally, you know, take and open the window and throw money out the window. And, you know, that's what we were always good at doing. Um, but we've learned over time that, you know, now, you know, we need to be more um, conscious of, of, of using energy. Um, with, you know, and, and, and it's air quality. I mean, as we started this, the, the original idea here was air quality. And through um, this type of equipment, you know, we're able to, to filter the air, condition the air, um, humidify the air. Um, all of these things become a benefit to what we're doing. Next. Again, here, you know, we're just showing some different um, applications of different types of buildings that um, has utilized um, the mini VRF technology. Um, I think if you want, we, we could just go through the, the rest of these slides one at a time. And, and with that, that it, it just shows you some of the different types of applications. Um, and so we can go on to next. Again, it looks like an apartment building with the lower level being um, a commercial. So again, the adaptation of being able to do both residential and commercial um, with the same equipment is very versatile. And, you know, that's one thing you've got here is you've got versatility. Next. Next. Again, you know, we're highlighting the mini VRFs. Um, and with that, it's only one part of what we can do. Um, and now with what GRI has done is GRI is actually, we've, we've created a two ton and two and a half ton system. So we've actually become more versatile um, than, than a lot of our competition. So we're able to go with our mini VRFs. We go from two ton to five ton. And what's the nice thing about um, the mini VRFs, and that's where it became very important with the school that we did, is that the school didn't offer three-phase technology. So with the mini VRF equipment, we operate on single phase. So that puts us in positions where um, three phase is not available or they look at it as it being uh, more cost effective to use single phase over three phase. So we go from two ton to five ton in mini VRF. We go from six ton to, as the charter court project showed you, 750 ton or a thousand ton. You can, it's unlimited on how you can match that up. But, you know, so the versatility is incredible. Next. 
again, another you know good thing about the mini product is because of the size of that um, outdoor unit, you can put it into all kinds of spaces. And as you can see here, um, you know they've got walls um, that separate like um, apartment levels, so they're they're tucking an outdoor unit because again they're narrow and thin. Um, into limited space. Solar. Um, as we, we talk about the fact that, you know, with the technology, we're looking to save 30 to 40% of our energy costs. And by adding solar to it, um, you're able to save approximately 65% of your energy costs. So um, the opportunities are endless at what you can do um, with this type of product. Next. Next. just some of the different applications and how they've um, been able to find space to install solar panels. And, you know, that becomes the only limitation to using um, solar is the space to put panels. Next. I think, um, We've about covered our presentation. Um, I guess we're going to move to some questions and answers. Yes, thank you so much, Chuck. That was a great presentation. And we got a very active audience asking a lot of questions. Some of them are already answered. For example, there's uh, one, uh, Ellen, asking about example of these units sharing roof with solar collectors. Uh, and we've really seen those. Uh, I will take that further and ask if we have any project like that in the United States. There is some projects on the West Coast right now. Um, I'm not familiar with exactly what they are, um, but I know that there is a few. I know exactly, actually, one high rise building out in California is over a thousand tons and it's solar. Um, I know that there's another um, opportunity that is in the Arizona market. I don't know a lot about it, but that was supposed to be over 4,000 tons. So um, here on the East Coast, we've got some small little. Um, you know, four and eight panel jobs that are, are you know, just very, very small. Um, there's been some homes that have been done, you know, with them, but um, on the commercial level, um, I don't know of any here on the East Coast at the time. Okay, thank you. Hope it answered your question, Ellen. Uh, we have a question from Scott. Aside from MERV and UV filtration, is ozone an effective decontaminator? Um, ozone, you've got to be very careful with ozone because ozone can be very dangerous. Um, I know that, that, you know, when you talk ozone, you talk about our atmosphere. And at the upper part of our atmosphere, they actually call it ozone. But I think in our world, they are actually two different things. Um, so with ozone, you have to be careful at how you utilize it. But it can be very effective um, in controlling contaminants, yes. Okay. Uh, another question from Leslie, how much longer to HVAC system? I think you mean durability if they are in an enclosed top roof, uh, enclosed top floor, instead of setting open to the element of the roof. Um, not, a, not sure I understand that question. 
Um, so if HVAC system get installed in an in enclosed space, right? Instead of sitting open to the uh, rains and winds. Uh, How long do you expect it to last? Yeah. Okay. Well, mo most most again heating and air conditioning systems usually have a um, we'll say a life expectancy of 25 to 35 years. Um, outdoor units, again, it depends on your climate. But um, usually you could probably get 15 years from an outdoor unit. Um, so again, they're, they're, it, but it, var it, it varies. But yes, you, 25 to 30 years on an, on an indoor unit, I mean, it's uh, quite a long time. So, have you got any maintenance issue coming back from client about getting damaged? Uh, you know, you know it, it's one thing. I mean, it is um, in working with degree product, I have been extremely impressed with the quality of their equipment. And over the five years that I've been involved with Greg, um, the issues have actually been minimal. Um, it's been, um, it, it, it's just, you know, I, I worked for another manufacturer for almost nine years and I can't say the same. Um, so with the quality of the product, the problems have been very limited. Yes. Great. Thank you. Um, for the Charter Court VRF project, what precaution would take in an event of a leak in the VRF line in the building to minimize impact to residents? I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Is there a leak in the VRF lines? Well, again, in reference to um, refrigerant leakage, no, there was no sensors included um, because I'm, I'm not sure what exactly that standard is, um, but there is a um, standard of amount of refrigerant to a space per square footage. And I'm not sure exactly um, what that is, but based upon the way the design was done, um, we did not meet the criteria needed to install refrigerant sensors um, to protect the space. Okay. Um, got some other answers uh, about the mini split system. So, sorry, I'm just reading. Uh, and there's a question from the Caroline. Uh, are there any advantage to heat recovery system as far as improving air quality? Or is it strictly a matter of filters and energy savings? Well, in, in reference to heat recovery, um, there's really, the advantage is that you're able to heat and cool at the same time. Um, that is the true advantage of heat recovery. Um, you know, so, you know, in reference to um, cleansing the air more or, you know, filtering the air, you know, heat recovery is, is being able to do both heating and cooling at the same time. That, that's the true advantage of that. Okay, thank you. Um, for a highly efficient home, it might only need less than one ton. Is three ton the smallest unit size great offers? No, um, actually um, for a, a single head system, we can go as low as 9,000 BTUs. Um, and that's the nice thing about the inverter technology um, because we're modulating. Um, we're, that 
um, 9,000 BTU unit can go as low as with some of them. And again, it depends on the sear factor, but some of those 9,000 BTU um, IDU units or indoor units can run at um, probably 2,500 um, BTUs. So that's where your energy savings comes in um, and you're able to, to use them in smaller spaces. Okay. Hope this answers your question, Ellen. Another question from you is how different is the inverter technology than the variant refrigerant flow? Well, it's still inverter technology. Okay. Um, when you're looking at VRF, you know, that, that term uh, variant, variable refrigerant flow is just how they've now defined the commercial product. Um, it's, still, it's still the same technology. It's, it's inverter technology. It's, now they, it's how they define it. So it's a matter of semantics, um, whether you call it a mini split, which is more utilized in the residential world um, or a VRF, which is utilized in the commercial world. But the technology is still the same. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have more questions about the mini split system. One um, audience asked about if they work well in open concept spaces in modern homes nowadays, or does it work better in like uh, rooms? No, I mean, again, um, it works real well in, in open spaces, um, you know, because again, the the airflow off of a the standard wall hung unit, um, it, it throws the air approximately 15 feet. Um, actually, Gree is introducing a brand new product right now that's actually going to have a throw capacity of 25 feet. Um, but it, they're constantly running. The, the fan in an indoor unit is basically always on. Um, but so what it's doing, it's circulating the air all the time. Um, but it's only, it's, it's only on based upon the needs. Um, and I guess I can utilize myself as a, as, as a, um, a factor here. Um, in my home, um, the first floor level, which is the living area, is about 1,200 square feet. And it's an open concept. I mean, we've got a couple walls, but it's basically open. And with that, um, I have two 12,000 BTU wall hungs um, and one, one in the front and one in the back, and it keeps the space very comfortable. So um, open concept is perfect. We love it. Okay. So I have a four-part question. Uh, does the multiple inverter AC carry the heat or cold refrigerant to the individual spaces? Repeat that one more time. So this audience asking if the inverter AC carry the heated or cooled refrigerant to the individual spaces. I think okay. he's referring to the heads. Here, here is the, and this is where the heat recovery makes the, it different. On, on a standard mini split system, heat recovery is not offered. So with that, your system is either going to be in the heating mode or it will be in the cooling mode. Um, you are not able to cool and heat with a standard mini split at the same time. Um, how, how a personalized temperature get controlled in a separate well, individual spaces? Um, it, you know, it depends, you know, what you're doing is, I mean, each, each indoor unit 
um, is individually temperature controlled. Um, so with that, um, you're setting a temperature in each space that there's an IDU. Um, or you also add multiple systems. Um, you know, as I, as I, um, as I stated, I, I have a three-story townhome. And with that three-story townhome, I have two three-ton multi-head systems. Um, in the living area right now, um, we have it in the heating mode. And it's kept at, you know, 70, 71 degrees. But in the sleeping area or the bedrooms upstairs, we actually have three bedrooms. Two of the units are, are shut off. They're not even on. But the one in the master bedroom, because I like it cool, keep, we keep the door shut. And I maintain 67, 68 degrees. So right now, my master bedroom is in the cooling mode um, because it's an individual system. But in the living area, um, where, to be honest with you, my girlfriend likes it a little bit warmer, you know, we keep it at like 71, 72 degrees. So that's the neat thing about being able to use multiple systems. Um, you're, <coughs> excuse me, you're able to do cooling and heating. Um, and that's the way to accomplish that. Okay. So more about the refrigerants. Uh, are the refrigerants environmentally friendly? I'm, I'm going to say no, because it's the law that you recover all refrigerant. Um, refrigerant, I mean, they, they're, they're constantly changing the refrigerant. Um, you know, we were R22, and then they moved to R410A. Um, and I know that I, I don't know what the model of it is. And, you know, there's different types of, you know, of what they utilize for refrigerant. But I know it's changing again in the next couple of years and they're going to move away from 410A. But I will say that the federal government um, is very, very particular on how you remove refrigerant from any type of appliance that has refrigerant in it. Um, that they literally offer bounties on people that allow the refrigerant to evaporate into the air. So um, it's a contaminant. It, yeah, it can be. Right. So uh, can we compare the system in energy efficiency wise to ground source heat pumps or hydronic radiant system? Um, ground source heat pumps, um, you know, basically what you're doing is you're pulling, um, water that you're using, um, to create heat and, um, the temperature, um, through ground source is the water is coming in at about 50 to 55 degrees. So, um, you're only increasing that temperature by 30 or 40% where um, you're, you know, again, so it, it allows you to reduce the energy cost to do that. Um, but it's very, very costly to do ground source. And in some areas, um, the space that you have it's, it's not prohibitive to do so. Um, and that's where the inverter technology, because we can operate on a quarter of a degree difference, um, we're able to, to save quite a bit of energy. Okay. Um, hydronic, I mean, hydronic, again, 
you're heating, you're not cooling. Um, and the only thing that you have to look at in reference to hydronic heat is the type of boiler that you're operating. Um, that, you know, nowadays they have boilers with efficiency ratings of, of 97, 98%. Um, and with that, it's, it, it can be very, very um, cost effective to hydronic, to do hydronic heating, but now you have to figure out how to cool when the, when the summertime comes. Okay, thank you. Uh, more about the multi-sluice system. When you have hundreds of indoor devices, like the Charter Court project, how right. is the per unit condensation handle in these VRF installation? Okay, with an IDU, with an indoor unit, you have to offer a condensate drainage. Um, the simplest way of doing that is gravity, but if you're not able to do gravity, there is multiple different types of condensate pumps available. Um, with that, some of those condensate pumps are so small that you're able to mount them right inside of an IDU. Um, and you don't even basically realize it's there. And most of them have a lift capacity of about 29 inches. So it's pretty flexible in reference to being able to tie into a drain line um, for the condensate. But yeah, during the summertime, these units will condensate very heavily. And yeah, you have to find a way to remove the condensation. Yep. Okay, thank you. Um, we have a couple questions from Christopher about the rate of indoor air exchange. So what is the rate of indoor air exchange currently? And what is the recommended value since the issue of COVID-19 in a commercial space? I can't answer that. I don't know. Okay. Um, so maybe this one in existing building and system, would that require return grills to have some kind of fan to increase the rate of exhaust? Well, yeah. I mean, again, um, for... All right, repeat that one more time. Let me make sure I get it right. So I think his question is about existing building. Right. And he wonders if you need return grills to increase the rate of exhaust. Um, I get, you know, it really, it really depends on um, the type of systems that you're using, but you know, if return air is very important and, you know, if, you know, you are um, allowing return air to be removed from each and every space, it's, you know, much better in improving the air quality. Um, but with many split systems, um, you're you're doing you're you're returning the air and reintroducing the air through your system through your IDU. So you don't need to add return air grills or fans or whatever. Um, the mini split itself will bring the air back into it, clean it back up and reintroduce it to the space. Um, and when you look at the that when you look at an indoor unit, you'll see that there is multiple different filters in in the indoor units. Okay, who would answer a question? And one more question about the high ceiling space: Is there any way to reduce energy to heat and cool a high ceiling space? 
uh, Christopher gave an example, say, if you only want the heat or cool interior space from finished floor to about like 10 feet high and not have to condition the space above 10 feet high. Okay. Uh, so, so with the, I mean, again, it's very simple. Um, and, and to, you know, give you, again, a little bit of an example, my family owns a couple of appliance uh, stores. So you've got big showrooms that are, uh, one of them is 14,000 square feet, the other one's 10,000 square feet, and we've got 18 foot ceilings. So what we did is we installed cassettes in those ceilings and we brought them down um, to 12 feet. So basically what we're doing is we're conditioning the air from 12 feet down to ground level. And we're not concerned about the air above that. And they have been operating very efficiently and maintaining cooling and heating at a comfortable level in the space. So it's a matter of where you mount the indoor unit in how much area you want to cover. But yeah, you can, you can bring it down to 10 feet, eight feet, um, take it up to 16 or 18 feet. Um, the only difference is what you're doing is that with the cubic feet of space that you're conditioning, you're designing a unit of a size that will handle it. Okay, great. Hope it answer your question. Um, more about uh, air quality. What is the filtration capacity of these indoor unit? I'm assuming you're referring to the mini split heads. Do they have MERV, HEPA, or UV? No. The answer is no. Um, but there, you know, like I said, you know, there there is um, newer systems coming out that are going to start incorporating some of those opportunities. But there's also um, secondary companies out there that offer product that can be added to um, indoor units that will control um, the types and percentages of, of contaminants that come through them. So, um, so at this point, they're, they're basically a standard filter. They're, uh, again, they're a washable filter. And they may be rated at, I don't know, MERV 4, MERV 6. Um, but to really, you know, and you brought this question up a couple times, exactly what is, is the air quality standard? And, you know, if you look at ASHRAE standard 52.2, it will lay out to you exactly what the um, approved standards are and based upon what the usage of the building is. Okay, thank you. We have a lot more question coming up. Um, so following up with the uh, high ceiling question, we have uh, Taufasan uh, questioning about how do we handle vertical temperature asymmetry with forced air systems? How do we handle, I'm sorry, what? So I think he's, uh, question about vertical temperature asymmetry so for example if hot air rises and the top of the room is hotter than the bottom that creates an asymmetry so okay. in a forced air system how do we handle stratifications and asymmetries like that well i mean again it, it then what you're doing is is you're taking um duct work to um, that level, um, you know, with, with a forced air system, um, you know, it's based upon duct work and it depends on what area you want to condition. So, you know, you have to decide if you've got a very large space with high ceilings 
and you want to condition that upper space, it's, uh, you know, allowing for the ductwork to be there, to be sized to handle that space. Okay. Hope that answered the questions. Um, for cooler climates where natural gas is available, how does the cost to heat with natural gas compare to the cost of heating with a heat pump? Um, well, again, and, and I, you know, again, we call our units heat pumps, but the real, I mean, uh, I like to add that term inverter. And what the difference is, and I don't know exactly how it breaks down, but um, it's, it's based upon therm of energy against kilowatt charge. So in areas where the kilowatt charge is very low, um, because in different parts of the United States, um, the kilowatt charge against therm charge, um, which is a, a gas heat, um, can be way different. So if you've got an area that say, let's say you're, you've got gas available to you, but your electric cost is, I don't know, less than 10 cents a kilowatt, um, it's more cost effective to use electric. Um, but also, you know, what, you know, we've done is, again, using multi-fuel, um, where this is a ni another nice thing about our T-Unix equipment. Um, we can take um, our outdoor inverter unit, and by adding a coil to a gas furnace, um, we're able to give them dual fuel um, so that if it's more cost effective at a certain time of the year based upon temperature, just to run the inverter um, unit as opposed to running the, um, the gas furnace, you're able to do that. So it allows versatility. So, it, it, so again, it goes back to the fact of cost per therm or cost per kilowatt. Okay. On um, what's more, more, more cost efficient. Great. Uh, we have less than 15 minutes to answer all the questions. So I'm going to try my best. Um, Ed here has a experience with considerable delay in obtaining replaced VR, a v, um, VFR control board in a Texas facility. So how does the landlord handle this issue in a big apartment building? How does the condensation handles at this unit? Like we said before, it needs to drain somewhere. Um, replacement of interior unit component. How reliable are those system? Uh, what electric upgrades were required at the apartment? Okay. Um... So this is a multi-level question. Yes. All right. And, you know, like, like I stated, and, and, and I've been extremely happy with the quality of the equipment that Gree has put out. Um, I can't say that about everybody's equipment. But with that being said, um, it may be recommended that, um, that you keep an extra control board or you keep an extra fan motor or you might want to keep a compressor um you know on hand that 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 will will make um that will make it easier um you know and 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 that's the biggest thing um about handling possible breakdowns or another thing that again you know, I like to do is to me, I love the word redundancy. Um, and by having multiple systems, you know, it allows us that when the unfortunate occurs and we have a breakdown, 
Um, if we have multiple systems, we're not losing 100% of the application. So it allows you the time to, um, to get the repair parts or get, you know, whatever is necessary. Keith also asked us some of a question about the uh, event of the leak. So I think we kind of answered that question. Yeah, what, what they need to do is, again, in ASHRAE, there's a standard in reference to refrigeration leakage based upon square footage. Okay. Um, and I don't know exactly, I forget exactly what that standard is. But if they check, um, you know, with ASHRAE, they can find out exactly what the um, refrigerant leakage um, standard is. Okay, thank you. Um, so a question from Scott, can mini split be ducted to condition several room in a single family application? Yes. Yes, I think we have the diagram of that. Um, perhaps yeah, we yeah, we do. Uh, again, and that's just one of the indoor units and that, be, and that adds the versatility. Um, if you have, excuse me, If you have a lot of smaller spaces and you want to condition them and you're not as concerned about individual controls, um, you can install a ducted unit um, or one of our vertical air handlers. And then you're able to condition multiple spaces with just one unit. Yes. Okay. Great, thank you. For Caroline, uh, would you please speak to cold beam air conditioning, meaning the chill beam system? Uh, are there any advantages to this in terms of indoor air quality, such as reduced airflow occupant comforts? Do you think it mm. contributes to uh, the occupant comfort? Well, I mean, of, of, of course, that, again, that's a nice thing about having multiple indoor units in different spaces that you're able to control the set points of temperature. Um, you, I mean, you're definitely increasing comfort. I mean, you know, when, when you utilize an old unitary system where you have one thermostat and you're trying to make four rooms, six rooms, eight rooms comfortable, you're only making one room comfortable. The rest of them are what it ends up being. But with, um, with, the, multi, with the mini splits and the multi-head systems, you know, and every space that you have an indoor unit, you are able to adjust your, comfortable level, your comfort level. So that's, the ben that's a big benefit. Uh, right, and Caroline wants to know specifically about the comfort level and air quality uh, for a radiant floor heating system. And can, can you comment on that? Well, um, being an old hydronics guy, I love radiant floor heat. Um, the thing is, is that... Um, Again, you're either doing that um, by electric wire or you're doing it by um, tubing, which is, um, there, there's two different ways of creating radiant floor heating. And, you know, and I think we'll all agree that our body heat a lot of times is controlled by our feet. So if our feet are warm, then we're comfortable. And that's the nice thing about radiant heat. And radiant heat is, is, is very um, efficient. Um, so, but you're, you're not controlling air quality. I mean, there, there's nothing to do with air quality there. Um, you're, you're, you're gonna, you're gonna have to obtain that another way. 
but you're not going to do that through radiant heat. Great. Uh, Lindsay had a install uh, installation questions. How should new HVAC system being installed by builders of divisions be different from the system 10 years ago? Well, 10 years ago, basically you were using a boiler with some baseboard heat um, or you're doing a um, furnace with a bunch of ductwork or you're doing an air handler with a bunch of ductwork. Um, but nowadays with mini splits, you can eliminate all that ductwork. So you're not taking up um, all of that space that the ductwork takes because with a mini split, you're running um, two uh, copper lines to each indoor unit that are quarter by half inch, quarter by three eighths, three eighths by five eighths. So with that, um, a line set takes up an area of about three inches in diameter. Um, so you're not wasting all of the space that ductwork would take up. So yeah, I mean, it's, it's incredible what you can do with them. It's just that it's just a little bit more costly. But when you look at your energy savings and your comfort level, where, where do you decide on what you do? Okay, thank you. Uh, we're approaching 1.30. Uh, so I apologize if we can't answer all of your questions. Uh, you can email uh, AIDC and maybe we can relay the question after the event. Um, I have one more question from Wesley about how much of a typical office flat roof space should be allocated for HVAC equipment? Um, again, that's hard to say. Um, you know, when you look at when you look at the footprint of this equipment, um, it's not that large. Um, so it can be very minimum. Um, so it, 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 that's, it, that's hard to answer. It, it really is. Okay. But it's minimal. We'll, it's we'll, minimal. We'll, We'll, we'll put it that way. It's minimal. Yes. Okay. Um, questions about other system. So for a radiant floor system, uh, obviously it doesn't address air quality. So what should be added to uh, address the indoor air quality? Well, I guess, you know, now we're going to, I mean, again, now with radiant floor, we're, we're talking about the fact that we're only able to do heating. Mm -hmm. So um, if we're going to add equipment to do air conditioning, this is where we can add an ERV or an HRV where we're able to put multiple filters at different levels to reduce the contaminants within the air. Okay, hope we can answer your question. And um, is there any activity of providing residential direct solar domestic hot water? So yeah, talk oh about yes, it. yes, yeah. That's I mean to be to be honest with you, that's been around for 20, 30 years, um, and probably even longer than that. Um, where you um, utilize um, the solar panel um, to, to heat, I mean, the heat, the, you know, the, the water runs through the solar panel. And again, um, or you can use glycol um, to, through the solar panel. So it depends on what market you're in. If you're in the Northeast, then you use a glycol base um, liquid that then runs through a coil inside of a tank that heats the water. 
Um, down south where you're not getting the freezing temperatures, you can use a solar panel that strictly operates on just water. Um, but you're still going to run it through a coil inside of a tank to heat the water. But, oh, yeah, that, that technology has been around for a long time. So, Okay. Thank you, Chuck, so much. And thank you for all the audience as, as a question. If you have any follow-up question, please reach out to education at AIABC.com. And if you're interested in a minister system, feel free to reach out to Gree and Wells in the U.S. Um, Chuck, any final words to share to our audience? Um, I appreciate your time. I hope I supplied you with the information that you were looking for. Um, and if not, you again, if there's more questions or whatever, again, just reach out to us and we'll supply you with hopefully anything and everything that you need. So, but besides this, set, send me an email when we're done. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.